Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Green Tech Today is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. I'm Becky Worley, and this is the Twit Network's Top 25 Green Tech Innovator Series. This episode of Twit's Top 25 Green Tech Innovators is brought to you by the Eco Imagination Challenge from GE. GE and its partners are awarding $200 million to ideas that help build the next generation power grid for the 21st century. For more information and to view and comment on ideas, go to ecomagination.com slash challenge. It's also brought to you by audible.com. To download a free audiobook of your choice, go to audiblepodcast.com slash greentech. Green energy innovation, be it solar, wind, even electric vehicles, are all dependent right now on one technology, batteries. If you want energy on demand, you have to be able to store that energy. And right now, batteries are a bottleneck. They're too big and too expensive. But one Indiana company, Enerdell, is trying to innovate and streamline the battery making process right here in the U.S. I went on a tour of their Indianapolis plant and talked to John Corbett, their quality control manager, about the incredibly technical process of making these electric vehicle batteries and how Enerdell is trying to make them smaller and cheaper. And trust me, explaining this process to a blonde was a challenge. This is the mixing operation where we take the raw materials, uh, carbon, various powders and active ingredients, mix them all together with high pressure, high speed mixers, and we transfer them into these tanks here, uh, which are slurry. So we have two types of slurry. And slurry is it's exactly that. It's a, a mixture of uh, aqueous and powdered materials. I think I had that at Dairy Queen once. It could, could it very the, well be. Maybe it was the mixed slurry. <laughs> I can't remember. It might be a blizzard, but oh, this, okay. is, this is a slurry. And we will transfer this material over to our coating operation, okay. where we begin the application of the slurry to the various foils. Okay, so let's just start at the beginning. You're you're making these batteries from scratch? From scratch. We start with the raw materials, some powder, uh, carbon and uh, lithium manganese oxide and various other chemicals. Mix it together with a binder and some solvents. And that becomes the slurry. Mm. We have two types, one for a negative and one for a positive. And later on, we'll marry those two together and make a battery. Mm. OK. If you say so, let's keep going. <laughs> All right. This is the, uh, the uncoiling of the aluminum foil. And we can run either aluminum or copper, depending on whether it's the anode or the cathode. The anode being the negative electrode, the cathode being the positive. The aluminum goes through this process, gets uncoiled and into a coating head. And at the coating head, we actually coat both sides of the substrate or the foil with the slurry. So that you look, think of it as you're paving a highway of slurry onto aluminum or copper roads. Is battery technology so set in stone that this is just an old recipe, or did you guys invent this one? The, the recipe is uh, one of the proprietary things that we really hold close to our best. Um, it, lithium ion technology is older than you may think. It's been around since the 1960s and even before that. But our particular recipe has been developed with a particular application in, in, in mind, whether it be an electric vehicle or a plug-in hybrid or a hybrid electric vehicle. It seems like uh, battery production right now is the Wild West in some ways. You know, you guys are kind of evolving at such an epic pace that things are changing fast. There's a lot of competition. Um, is this kind of a, a process that's in process? Uh, it is, and I think you'll see the entire process evolve over time. Uh, there are new technologies that will be coming out on how you coat the substrates. Uh, right now it's being applied with a slurry, 
in the future it may be electro deposited without any aqueous solution so we'll embed that directly into the foil as opposed to coating it on like paving down a road hmm. okay all right cool as we're walking we're walking down the oven of the coater so what we saw earlier was the front end in order to burn off the solvents and we really don't burn them off we actually reclaim them so the, the material that's coated dries through this five zone oven over time and the volatile chemicals that tr creates the VOCs actually gets captured and recirculated back into a holding tank where we use it again when we sell it back to the supplier and recycle it and sell it back to us so it's a closed loop system right. and there's no emissions no VOCs which are no bad VOCs. gases up in the air exactly good I shouldn't flip any of those, huh? I would not flip okay. any of those switches. Just check it. <laughs> so now we see the tail end of the process. This is mm. a single side coated electrode uh, that's being coiled up, and this is the tail end of the coating process. So uh, tell me in terms of, I see the entire sheet of aluminum coming up, and right. then the black material is what's come out of the slurry and all of that? The, the black part is the active ingredient on the foil which actually acts as the transfer of the ionic uh, electrochemical reaction. So this might be positive or negative depending on what the recipe is for this well, one? It, with, our, with our configuration, the aluminum is the positive electrode. Okay. Got it. You see there's a line right down the center. So we're getting twice the capacity out of this coil. Mm -hmm. We'll take this double, uh, double wide roll of electrode material and we'll slit it down the center where we'll use it for another process. So the, the final portion of the assembly of a cell is taking those components that we talked about at the beginning of the process, the mixed coated foils, we, we shape them into the form of an electrode, stack them up, and interweave some separator material. It's almost like making baklava. <laughs> and then we put it in this little paper or uh, aluminum foil bag that's like a potato chip bag, seal it up, put some electrolyte in it, and then it's uh, ready to become a battery cell. Thin is in. Thin is in. This is about a six millimeter battery cell uh, capable of, of about 17 to 18 amp hours of energy and power over time. And in battery, smaller is better, right? Smaller is better, uh, but depending on the customer's application, size is a factor. And they may want thinner, they may want thicker. It depends on how much of mechanical constraint they have. Why is this a big deal? Well, uh, it's, it's a renewable source. We're, we're using raw materials that are inherent to the earth but they're in very small quantities. Uh, we're eliminating the, the use of foreign oil because we're getting rid of the use of gasoline, especially when you go to electrification of vehicles. So, you know, less gas, more jobs, uh, a lot more growth in the industry. It's a tremendous win-win for everybody. We're partnering with uh, four of the, the biggest uh, venture capital firms in the clean energy space, three in the U.S., one in Europe. Uh, you know, again, we think that the combination of GE investment and venture capital investment is going to allow us to increase innovation. It's going to allow us to accelerate new ideas. It puts us shoulder to shoulder with some of the smartest tech investors. And we can use the, what I would call the industrial clout of GE to bring technologies to this marketplace faster. GE announced its challenge at a San Francisco event along with its four venture capital partners, Emerald Technology Ventures, Foundation Capital, Kleiner Perkins Caulfield and Byers, and Rockport Capital Partners have all joined with GE. Ideas from companies and individuals can be entered through the ecoimagination.com website for the next 10 weeks. So check out ecoimagination.com. To really understand the impact of innovating batteries, we talked to Sean Hendricks. He's the Director of Product Development at Enerdel. Why is energy storage a bottleneck for renewable energy? If you look at all these different technologies, the, the solar, the wind, 
even to some degree the automotive technologies that are, that are using the gas engines and the diesel engines, they all have kind of peak operating efficiency points. And so they, and what that means is that they do something very well only in a small, uh, small window. And so to compensate or to take advantage of that, that uh, area of operation, they need something to store that energy. And so everybody naturally turns to, to batteries. A perfect example is wind power. Uh, you know, it's very easy in, in, in many parts of the country to put up uh, windmills and take advantage of that, uh, of that resource. However, peak wind power occurs generally in the middle of the night when energy demand is the lowest. So how do you reconcile that difference between generating a lot of power in the middle of the night when, when not as many people need it to essentially shifting that to the middle of the day when the air conditioners are running, when people are at work and the, the manufacturing plants are running. And so the way to do that is to store that energy that's generated overnight in some sort of energy storage system, a battery for example, and to enable that energy to be generated at night and then used during the day when we really need it, when we really have our peak demand. What's the role of batteries in combating global warming? I really see batteries as a core technology and supporting the battle against climate change. The energy storage system or the battery really enables solar wind from a power generation standpoint. It's also a key factor in enabling uh, clean transportation technologies like electric vehicles. A lot of us think of batteries as, you know, bong bong, the copper top or what you put into your old toys, but batteries have changed a lot. Um, highlight some of the advances in this technology. There's been lots of research done in the last 20 years particularly in the, in the lithium ion battery technology. The big advances are that we were able to fit more energy and more power in a smaller space and make that energy last longer than any other battery technology we've seen before. These batteries are very large. Uh, they're, they may weigh several hundred pounds and take up a, a big chunk of space in the battery today. But as far as how long they last, really today we're shooting to make batteries last as long as your car does. 10 years, 15 years, or even more in some cases. As far as recharge time, we're using all sorts of input power sources to recharge our batteries. We're using the gasoline engine in the case of plug-in hybrids. We're using the wall outlet in your garage, or maybe in your workplace you're installing fast charging stands. It's, a, it's really a diversity of input power sources that let us use the, the power source that's most efficient at the, at the uh, right location to help you uh, recharge your battery in your vehicle. I'm a geek, so I think about computers getting faster, twice as fast every 18 months. Well, with batteries, how fast is the technology speeding up? Not quite on the same pace as, uh, as Moore's Law. Uh, that kind of sets the, sets the target, if you will. Uh, but really, battery technology is making increases every two to three years in terms of increasing the amount of energy in the same, uh, in the same space or the same amount of weight. Every couple of years, two to three years, we're increasing three to five percent in terms of the amount of energy that we're storing in the same amount of space, the same amount of volume. But we're very much at the early stages of this, uh, of this technology and its adoption in all these different fields from renewable energy to transportation. We want to take a quick break to thank our sponsors. This episode of Green Tech Today is brought to you by Audible.com. Audible.com is a leading provider of audiobooks with more than 75,000 downloadable titles across all types of literature, including fiction, nonfiction, and periodicals. Now, for listeners of Green Tech Today, Audible is offering a free audiobook to give you a chance to try out the service. So what you want to do is go to audiblepodcast.com slash greentech Pick a book that you're interested in, download it, and get started with the service. And I'll tell you, one of the things that I really like to do with Audible books is listen to them while I'm out walking. Um, it's a great way to keep yourself moving, to exercise, while at the same time engaging your brain. For me, this is especially true when it comes to nonfiction books I want to read. Um, it's great to be thinking and active in your brain as you're walking around, especially if you're out in nature. It's a good fit for those of us who do have a, a green and an environmental bent, if you will. So go to audiblepodcast.com slash green tech and check them out. Thanks for your support.
Is this technology just about cars? And that's exactly right. It isn't just about cars. That's a big market. It's a big, uh, it's a big area today. But we're really seeing interest and pull from all these different market segments, from grid storage to residential to commercial energy storage. Everybody in the world and across market segments is interested in doing what they can to increase their efficiency. There are always going to be naysayers. So what do you say to the people who think, ah, electric car, it's not going to take me far enough, recharging, there's no infrastructure. What do you say to them? The costs today are very expensive. But as we ramp up to the manufacturing technologies necessary to make these batteries, we get into high volume production, we start to make tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, eventually millions of electric or, or hybrid electric vehicles, the costs drop significantly in the ranges that you'd expect a mass market uh, consumer to, uh, to be able to afford. Is this trading one evil for another? Are we going from sort of an OPEC of today to a lithium group of tomorrow? Sure. The, uh, you know, that question comes up all the time is, is are you changing your, your dependence on oil to a dependence on batteries or even raw materials? And the answer is that, you know, there's so much innovation happening in the, in the industry today. There's so much uh, research into material types and the abundance of these resources that I think we've got a long future ahead of us before we run into any sort of uh, battery material shortage. Is this somehow a Betamax VHS format war? Not really. This technology uh, war, as you put it, we've seen this happen before. We, we saw this happen in the cell phone world. Nickel metal hydride technology was the first step in enabling laptops and cell phones to begin to shrink their size. However, ultimately they ran into the same uh, power and energy limitations, but that technology couldn't overcome the, uh, the, the, the size factors. And so now lithium technology, uh, as it happened in cell phones and laptops, is kind of emerging as the, as the next step in the technology evolution for advanced batteries. Lithium ion can get smaller basically, can get right? Small, get more energy in a smaller space. You're trying to get these batteries smaller, cheaper, more efficient, but is, is there a, a physical threshold where it's just as good as it gets? How close are we to that point? We're, we're just at the very beginning there. We've made our first major technology leap as we've moved lithium ion from cell phones into uh, automotive and advanced energy storage applications. But we haven't even, we're just scratching the surface on the advanced materials and advanced chemistries that we have available. I think the best example is you can look at nickel metal hydride as kind of a black and white chemistry. You've got two options basically. But lithium ion is kind of like a rainbow palette of options uh, for the chemists and the engineers to choose from. And so we've got a lot of experimentation, a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, range left yet in the development of that technology. You know, a big deal here is these batteries are made in America, right? Absolutely. The great thing about the uh, lithium ion industry today is that uh, manufacturing capacity uh, traditionally has been centered around the, uh, the Asian area uh, because of the location to uh, consumer electronics. However, now with these advanced technologies, the playing field has been leveled and America is beginning again to compete in the large scale manufacturing of advanced lithium ion batteries. Yeah, that whole concept of the earth, environmentalism, tree huggers, we're doing it for our kids. Does that play here? It does, but uh, I like to bring it to a much more practical and personal level, which is, you know, I'm doing something that, uh, that helps my family, both from the, uh, the planet or the environment of the future, but I'm also setting the stage for a new industry that maybe my children will work in 20, 30 years from today. Hey, thanks for watching. If you have any comments on the show or anything for the Twit Network's Top 25 Green Tech Innovators Series, email us, greentechtoday at twit.tv.